time in nature is as important to the well-being of an individual as nutrition and sleep. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudoua, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, last week we had talked about some of the problems that families today might be experiencing because of this thing that you know, that someone else coined the phrase nature deficit disorder. Yeah, we talked about the circumstances Mm -hmm. and the, you know, the causes of Mm -hmm. this alienation from nature that is so much more common today right. than in any past time of history. Right. And and one of the things that was really remarkable about last week, so listener, if you did not hear the podcast, at least know about the story, the book that you were talking about, Andrew, about what is it called? Bud and Me? Bud and Me. The, right. The two Abernathy brothers that rode across the country on their horses in the early 1900s at very young age. Well, and when my boys were young, because, you know, I have three boys, and I looked for good read-alouds that I think would attract their attention, you know, and keep them engaged. And the Little Britches series was something that I read out loud to my boys. And I was always so impressed with how young these kids were. And And resourceful, too. Oh, my goodness. And all the work that they did. I don't know if my boys were as inspired as I was to get more work done at a younger age. Yeah, and books like My Side of the Mountain, Mm -hmm. where you just see, wow. You know, kids in a situation where they have to take responsibility and deal with hard things. Yeah. And, and and part of that, I think, is more natural when you're out, you know, mm-hmm. in, a, in a natural environment. Exactly. Uh, even if it's, you know, something as simple as damming a stream mm-hmm. or building a fort or navigating your way back from somewhere. I remember climbing on Catalina Island. Mm-hmm alone, probably around 11 or 12, and being lost Mm -hmm. and having to really figure out which way was the ocean Mm -hmm. because I needed to get back to the beach so I could get back to the boat. And I had like a moment of panic. And it's I think every kid probably has a few moments in life, at least they should, where they basically say, God save me and I'll be good. (laughs) (laughs) Just help me through this crisis Mm -hmm. and I promise to be a better person, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, a a good response. Mm -hmm. I remember one time being out in a Sabbat, a little dinghy, and the waves were huge and the wind was blowing harder than ever and the water was coming over the edge and I was trying to bail. (laughs) And I was far. I was way out in the ocean thinking I could die. I could actually swamp this boat Mm -hmm. and drown. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew how to swim, but I thought, I mean, I thought I could die. It was one of those other times where you're just up against something that's so much bigger than you are. And so let's talk then about some of the the consequences of this alienation from nature. One thing that Louv points out that I have noticed uh, even before I read his book, I was talking about this in my talk on music, and that is that almost all children are born into and live in an auditorily polluted environment. Yes. There's a constant buzzing, a constant humming, appliances in the house, traffic outside, and it's really hard to escape that unless you can get out somewhere where there's no electricity, right? which would be what? You know, on a lake, hiking in the hills, uh, if you live remotely enough. And that's, that's kind of a hard thing to get to. And yet what happens is when you are experiencing silence, you're 
auditory faculties start to tune into smaller. Mm. Uh, your your sensitivity increases, and you start hearing things you wouldn't normally hear, whether those be patterns of sound in ocean waves or birds. Uh, you know, we can go all day just hearing the buzzing of our you know, air conditioner systems and our machines and cars and all that. And so there's that auditory pollution, and we need periodic breaks from that. Mm -hmm. I, I doubt any of us are going to say, let's just say no to electricity and go live completely off the grid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not reasonable. But we need, like we need breaks from things. We need a break from that constant buzzing. Visual kind of pollution, you know, when you're indoors, you don't get anywhere near the variety that you get when you're mm. out of doors. You look at carpets or walls and they have patterns. And we try to alleviate that tedium uh, by putting pictures on mm -hmm. the walls mm -hmm. as we have in this <laughs> tiny little podcast studio yes. that we've tried to soundproof with moving company blankets. And it works. And we have these ridiculous pictures <laughs> Of what are they? Nature scenes. They are. And why Why does the human want to see the ocean and a tree or Yosemite, uh, you know, or the, the lights along the shore? It's because it creates a variety that enriches our experience. You mm -hmm. think about hiking up a trail and everything's different. You know, every tree, every leaf on every tree is different in some small ways. So there's a sensitivity to detail, even tactilely. You know, when we spend large amounts of time inside very tightly controlled temperature, temperature regulated environments, we don't experience the cool wind on the face or the heat of the sun on the brow or, uh, and we're so we're, we're less willing to experience those types of things. And what that causes then is it causes a deadening to some degree mm. or a narrowing, I guess, of our senses of hearing and seeing and tasting and touching and smelling. One thing that, you know, has been noticed is the problem of child obesity. Oh, yes. Uh, this has been, uh, I think, uh, Michelle Obama as first lady was trying to bring attention to mm -hmm. uh, this problem. And there could be many factors influencing that. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly the change from being outdoors and riding bikes and climbing mm -hmm. trees and pickup games in the in the Kind of freestyle school. way. Yeah, freestyle. Mm -hmm. As to, you know, let's look at screens mm -hmm. and let's gain our recreation from mm -hmm. very sedentary activity mm -hmm. can't be anything but a negative effect mm -hmm. on not just the overall health, but, but also the, the mental health yeah. as well. Sure. One thing Louv points out is when you have more contact with nature, you are likely to have a better concept of where your food comes from. Okay. He uh, interviewed, uh, as a part of this, these first graders in New York City, and he asked them, so where does milk come from? Mm -hmm. And almost all of them answered either from the carton or from the store. Okay. There weren't a whole lot who w would answer from a cow. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, I think just the getting out once in a while and seeing cows – Right. You know, changes your perspective. What is that? Well, mm -hmm. it's a cow. You mm -hmm. know, what does it do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it gives you milk. And, and here, Louvre didn't mention this, but this is my own little observation. As children became more and more disconnected from, from nature and less likely to see nature in action, it gave rise to the need for sex education in oh, schools. Okay. Because, I mean, think about it. hundred. 50 years ago, if you lived anywhere except right in the middle of a city, you would see animals mm -hmm. and you would learn about the birds and the bees and the dogs and the horses pretty much just as a natural part of being mm -hmm. in the natural world. Mm -hmm. You know, those are, are a few of the problems that, you know, he articulated. He didn't go quite so far as to wax spiritual mm -hmm. about it. 
But uh, if I'm correct, I believe it was Augustine who said, nature is God's first book. Mm. So we know the nature mm. of the creator through both, you know, the revealed word, mm -hmm. but also through the revelation of, mm -hmm. of nature. And I look back as, you know, that great amount of time I spent, you know, in nature, in the water, on hills, in trees, on roofs, staring at the sky, contemplating, you know, stuff without distraction as really kind of cultivating a spiritual aptitude. And that, you know, has been a, a blessing mm -hmm. in my life. And I think I would be very different if I were born in today's world and had way too much access to screen-based recreation or entertainment. Rather than seeing the world as much bigger than you. Exactly. Yeah. So it's tough. There's no easy solution. Mm -hmm. What we do, I think, as families have to do is kind of prioritize. Not everyone can say, I want to go live out, you know, in the very rural area and have acres and wilderness around. Mm -hmm. It's just not possible. It's not mm -hmm. practical. Mm -hmm. But I look at, you know, a couple of my daughters who do live in cities and have children. Mm -hmm. And what I notice is that they make clear and consistent effort to get to somewhere mm -hmm. where those kids can explore. Right. And really, I think that's part of it is the freedom to explore. I visited one daughter not long ago, and we went down to this park area that was near a lake. And she has six children. The oldest one at the time was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. these are all young children. Right. And I was pretty much amazed at how they felt the freedom to just go. Mm -hmm. And she didn't have anxiety mm -hmm. about that. And one of them, fairly young, I think eight maybe, she climbed way up in this tree in this park and then started picking the pears and throwing them down. Oh, dear. <laughs> and we went home with great loads of pears that were obviously, you know, available. And mm -hmm. we... And that daughter made pear crisp for dinner that oh, night. Oh, nice. You know. <laughs> uh, and, and so you just have to say we're going to take the time. And, and it's inconvenient. It is inconvenient to load six children in a van and drive 15, 20 minutes or something to have that, you know, hour or so of experience in that, in that natural environment. I guess we were there more than an hour. We ended up doing a lot of skipping rocks oh, on right. the lake. Uh -huh. And the, the children were quite amazed at Grandpa's ability to oh. skip rocks, mainly because I had spent so many countless hours practicing as a child yes. <laughs> at the beach. But you, So you have to make it a priority. There's, a, I think, a very interesting website blog called Free Range Children. And this is a discussion of all mm -hmm. sorts of people talking about how can we fight against uh, the constrictions and restrictions and perceptions uh, of, of possible danger that aren't real in the sense of that, that it's worth c containing your children and restraining them. Mm -hmm. And how do we make an argument for letting children be more free mm -hmm. and experience those benefits of being outdoors that I think if we if we all consider you know it's it's overwhelming to think about a big camping trip mm -hmm. you know especially with a bunch of kids you're like oh man there's a lot of detail from the food you got to pack up and prepare and where you're going to sleep and equipment and you think about the expense and you're like ah mm -hmm. So maybe that's not the solution. Maybe the solution is just if, you know, especially if you're homeschooling, to say, let's just take half a day off. Mm -hmm. Let's just stop, quote, school, you know, before lunch, pack a picnic and head out, you know, to a park or, mm -hmm. or somewhere. You know, even in Tulsa, 
uh, we have this very awesome park that is now becoming famous. Yes. Uh, around the whole country, people uh, people say, "Oh, you're from Tulsa." Oh, I heard about that the the gathering place. The gathering place. And one of the things I really like about this is you look at some of the play equipment mm-hmm. and you think someone could actually hurt themselves on this, <laughs> and that's a good thing. Yes, they it's have. A, Swings and slides and ropes to climb on. Yeah, and, and paths, high places and, yeah. to go. And it, you know, and, I and rem- it's huge. It's huge. So, you know, even within a city, it mm-hmm. is possible to have moments mm-hmm. of experiencing that. Because I think being in nature, you know, as, as I said, you know, being lost in the mountains and trying to find my way back to the beach, mm-hmm. I suppose I could have stayed lost. Mm-hmm. Or I could have been attacked by a wild boar, or I could have, you know, had to sleep, you know, in the dark. And, and I, I suppose something truly bad could have happened to me. Mm-hmm. I suppose out in my little dinghy, mm-hmm. I could have swamped the thing and, and drowned. But in having those experiences, it really, I think, allows you to cultivate this this courage. I'm, I'm sure you've had mm-hmm. things like that from your childhood, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, you know, sailing comes to mind. My sister and I raced sailboats on the lake, and this would be in Minnesota. And um, the lake that we raced our boat on was kind of in a valley, so the winds were rather unpredictable. And we were very small. I mean, I was 11, she was nine, and I think our combined weight was 100 pounds sailing this scow. And one time we came around the buoy and jibed, and you know what (laughs) happens next. We capsized, and that was one of the most frightening things that I've ever experienced. But, you know, it it all worked out because it was a race. It was monitored, and the people came out to help us because because we caps we did more than just capsize we turtled oh. which the camp went all the way upside down and hmm. it was just a disaster but yeah very frightening and way too young to be having these types of experiences in today's world Only, but that was so normal then what, but what did it do for you oh well of course, certainly leadership skills yeah. and certainly courage you and thought, certainly, hey, if i could survive that i can take other risks i can survive I can... working with you yeah something like that <laughs> You know, and and then I think there's two aspects of being in nature. For me, I remember one is just the solitude that Mm -hmm. it provided. Mm -hmm. I think most children have a lack of opportunity for unencumbered solitude. And there's, you know, I can't remember the quote, but it was some philosopher said, you know, most of the world's problems would be solved if we could all just be happy being alone with ourselves Hmm. for long periods of time because that would create the more philosophic mindset it would cultivate kind of a maturity and and uh, there's there's one thing about being in nature is it's so much bigger than you and and that is a really good thing because while it can cultivate courage and resourcefulness it also can cultivate humility Mm -hmm. And, and even gratitude. Uh, the other thing that happens is when you're with people, there's a bonding that occurs. You and your friend mm-hmm. capsizing the boat together. Sister, yeah. And we're still great friends. Oh, your sister. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I remember things with my parents or mm-hmm. my sister. Mm-hmm. And, and those are memories that stick, um, even though they weren't necessarily entirely pleasant. No. I remember falling backwards on some cactus on Catalina Island, and I had cactus all in my buttocks. Oh, dear. And it was just horrible. And my father very patiently Mm. plucked out every little bit of cactus spine. And I don't know that, you know, obviously it wasn't fun, but his patience Mm -hmm. and and my gratitude— That was the real lasting effect, right? Um, rather than just the pain of having, you know, cactus spines in your body. <laughs> um, you know, I think that, you know, in conclusion, uh, Louvre made a statement, um, and I think he made the case very well in the book, and our experiences have reinforced this, but he says, time in nature 
is as important to the well-being of an individual as nutrition and sleep. But it, I think, you know, it's the easiest to neglect. Mm -hmm. uh, we can certainly short ourselves on sleep. That mm -hmm. is easy to do, especially as you get into, you know, having things you really want to do right. or you're a college student or you're starting a business um, or you're a mother with many children, mm -hmm. some of whom don't sleep through the night. Right. Nutrition, you know, we have to attend to that. We've talked a bit about it in the past. But this idea of carving out time to just first be outside and then try to be outside in a place that is restorative to mm -hmm. the soul. Mm -hmm. And you can do it. Even when you live in a city, you can, you can do it. And uh, I think the impact on our children will be, you know, more than we would imagine if we take the effort and make the time and, and do that. Yep, I agree. And, you know, just thinking about the memories, when my boys get together and talk about things that they did growing up, a lot of times they talk about the camping trips, mm -hmm. the days at Yosemite, the days in the Grand Canyon, the big hike that we did. And those were all done outdoors. And I don't know that my husband and I were thinking, oh, we should do this really cool thing so that our children, when they become adults, will talk about this. But it truly did happen, and it's well, definitely and, worth and it. You, you, as parents, you kind of continue on with your children what your experience exactly. was. Exactly, yep. And if our children's children mm -hmm. have somewhat of the heritage that our parents gave to us, yes. that will be good for the world. And if they don't, if they fall into this kind of electronic, sedate, indoors, artificial life with fewer and more rare opportunities to experience the, the dangers and the exhilarations that nature offers, that will be sad. Yep. So listeners, as Andrew has already said, we just encourage you to get outdoors with your kids as often as possible. Even That's if it's a little cold. <laughs> That's right. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Pudua and the team at IEW, I thank you for allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking.